It's great to be back with you uh, this, this week. If you don't remember, I was, I was gone last week and I was able to go on vacation with some, some fellow priests. It's annual vacation where we go to, to Lake of the Woods and we go, we go ice fishing. And about two or three days into the trip, my mind pretty much shuts off. It's amazing. I don't think about anything other than, will this fish bite my lure? Why is this fish not biting my lure? Do we have enough bait? And that's always a good question. If the answer is no, it means the fishing was good. We did run out of bait, by the way. So there we go. But with my buddies as well, sometimes the questions go like this in my mind. Are they having a good time? Are they enjoying the trip? Do they want to catch a bigger fish than I do? Do I want them to catch a bigger fish than I do? And I start worrying a little bit if they're actually having a good time or not. You know, this past summer, the opportunity I've preached about this before, I was able to go on a, on a cruise with my, my mom. And on that cruise, I, I ran into something I wasn't expecting. There's a lot of solo cruisers those who go on a cruise ship by them, themselves, even, even married couples, they say, I'm going on a cruise by myself. And my, my mom and I struck up a couple conversations with some solo cruisers, and we asked them, like, why are you on this cruise by yourself? And they said, because I don't have to worry about anyone else but myself. I can do what I want to do. I can wake up when I want to wake up. Whatever activity I want to do, I can do and I'm not worried if it's going to bring the other person, you know, it's going to, they're going to like it or not. I can do what I want to do. And I thought, huh, I could see that sometimes. But in another sense, I was very grateful to be with my, my mom, by, by the way. You know, we hear about this worrying about other people in our second reading today. We continue to read from St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians. We've been reading this the last couple weeks. We're going to continue to read from this until we begin the season of Lent. It's always important to remember who St. Paul is writing this letter to. It's the community of, of Corinth. Now, this community of Corinth, by the way, isn't exactly the most, how would we put it, uh, pious people in the, in the world. Even a couple weeks ago, we're, we'd be reading from uh, Corinthians chapter 6, and before that, Corinthians chapter 5, St. Paul is admonishing someone, stop sleeping with your mother-in-law. And today, he's jumping and saying, enter into the celibate state if it's possible. That's a big jump in two chapters, by the way. But why does he say this? Well, it's important to remember, how did our second reading end last week? It was 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 31. For the world in its present form is passing away. For the world in its present form is passing away. And so what St. Paul is really trying to tell the community of Corinth is that we're not living just for this world. It's this old saying, right? We're called to live in the world, but not of the world. And so he encourages them. He says, brothers and sisters... I should like for you to be free of anxieties. And he tells them a way for this to, to happen. He says, an unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. This is the same thing about the unmarried woman or a virgin. is anxious about the things of the Lord so that she may be holy in both body and spirit. A married man or a married woman, on the other hand, is anxious about the things of the world how he may please his wife or how she may please her husband. And they are divided. Now, it's important to remember, St. Paul does not say that every single person should enter into the celibate state. If that was the saying, and if everyone lived that out, we wouldn't be here, right? We, we know this. But what he is telling us is what? Well, our focus needs to be on the Lord. And if someone enters into the married life, you know that it's hard not to focus on the world. You want to make sure you have what? Enough resources to provide for your spouse, provide for your children, and everything else. And yet St. Paul is saying in this beautiful reading, what he is saying is be cognitive of this and not to be caught up in 
the world. He says, I am telling you this for your own benefit, not to impose a restraint upon you, but rather, but for the sake of property and adherence to the Lord without distraction, remembering that we're called to live for the Lord. So how can one do that in the married life, knowing as St. Paul says, well, it's going to bring some anxieties? Well, as a husband and wife, hopefully they can come together and say, what is our goal? Remember, the goal in married life is what? To help each other encounter the Lord. To help each other get to heaven. And how does one do that? Well, praying together. And in that as well, saying, let's not get distracted of these worldly things. I often think the perfect example for married life, of course, is the holy family of Mary and Joseph gazing upon the Lord together. What a beautiful image that can be as a married couple. That we're not only gazing upon your children or upon each other, you can gaze upon the Lord. Because if all you are doing is gazing upon your spouse or your children, then you're putting them above the Lord. And this is an easy temptation to give in to. It's so easy. This is the world tells us to do. Put your children above everything else. Put your children even above your spouse and definitely above the Lord. But St. Paul is saying, no, 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 no. Place the Lord upon above everything else, and that's going to help you to what? It's going to help you to be a better spouse and to be a better parent. As for this great gift of St. Paul speaks of as well, of celibacy. Of course, who enters into the celibate state? Well, priests and, and religious, brothers and, and sisters. And why is that? Because it helps me to, yes, stay focused on the Lord. And plus, if I wasn't in the celibate state, I'd be completely divided. And so this gift of celibacy is actually a great gift a great gift in which I'm able to focus more on the Lord, and it frees me up as well to help you hopefully focus on the Lord as well. It's not a hindrance. It's not something like, oh, you have to enter into the celibate state. Instead, it's rather a great gift. I often joke around with my brothers and sisters, uh, and also some parishioners sometimes, and I see them with their uh, two or three kids or one child that's sick. I'm like, whew. I think I chose the better part over here, which isn't necessarily true, by the way. But in that, in that same sense, this gift of, of celibacy helps me and so many other priests and brothers and sisters and even some lay people, consecrated lay people, have chosen to enter into the celibate state to really focus on the Lord. Because my brothers and sisters, this world is passing away in its present form. And what do we need to be preparing for? Preparing for being one with God in heaven. Yes, praying that we're united with the community of believers, the communion of saints, but in that same sense, being one with the Lord and not being distracted. So whatever vocation the Lord is calling us to enter into, remember, we always must put the Lord first. And in doing so, it's going to free us from anxieties of this world and instead free us up to live for the Lord.